Uh, welcome to the Beyond Cinema Studio here at Sundance, Rebecca Brando, Stephen Riley. Uh, firstly, just congratulations for having made this film and having it here at Sundance. What does it mean to you, Rebecca, looking at these images, hearing these voices, you know, like, what, just how does it make you feel? Well, that's a really good question because I've seen the film twice and the first time I was overwhelmed with emotion because it was like bringing my father back to life and so hearing his voice and his soft, hypnotic voice and, and watching my family and, and hearing the things he used to talk about no, growing up no. was um, was just filled with emotion, and, and, and but I loved watching it. It was beautifully done. And then the second time, I saw it from a different perspective, and I think Stephen and, and Stephen Riley and John Bassett did a great job in really getting to the essence of who my father was and a man who was really behind it. The movie star. And so, what did you find? What did you find most remarkable about him, the man behind the movie star? Just that it hum humanized him. Um, that you know, we all have the same emotions. We all deal with the same demons of in, in the pains in our lives, and we all have to deal with feeling inferior, inferior, or feeling um, less than, or not good enough, and. And that's what he struggled with. And, and it's hard to imagine a, a great man like that who's done so much with his acting, his human activism, his, his environmental vision for a better world, and who could have those similar feelings. Um, so, yeah. That's yeah, and Stephen, for you, I mean, all those things that Rebecca just talked about, you've got the activism, the environmental aspect of his work, the, act the actual acting, and then the personal nature of who he was. and how he lived his life, fitting all that in within this short time frame with these images and using drawing from that ma the material that you had. Like what was the kind of the biggest challenge in finding that balance for you? Um, just that, I mean there's so much, so much to um, involve, so many um, things at our disposal, materials at our disposal. Uh, once it became clear about the full extent of the, the archive, um, which was just actually being, being um, unboxed at the time when the film was being made, um, uh, and the personal effects, the documentation, the photos, I mean, ugh, all, all this stuff to, to go through. Um, and then faced with the, the, the complexity of, of, of Marlon, and I think he was a deeply complex man, um, quite contradictory at times. I mean, I, I, I found myself getting quite confused early on about you know, who the real person was, but people have been trying to figure that out for decades, yeah. you know, who was the real Marlon Brando. And so I thought that, you know, very clearly that, that Marlon would be the best person to to um, reveal that and let him carry the whole show and and um, and and speak of his true essence. In terms of your pre this film Marlon Brando knowledge and experience, like who, which Marlon was your Marlon? Was it a was it a Godfather Marlon? Was it a was it a you know something else? Like what was your relationship to him as a person or as an actor? What, what well, I mean, I, I liked. I mean, obviously, I. I, I I was a big fan of uh, you know his bigger roles. I'd seen Tango, Godfather, and um, um, uh, you know I'd, I'd, I'd <coughs> Apocalypse. I loved him in all those films, but I didn't know much about him at all. And um, when I came to start researching the film, it was kind of from scratch, and uh, you know I knew some you know some bits, some snippets from his life, but had never sought to piece it together. But um, I would say you can't you can't isolate Marlon into different eras. You know he, the 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 full evolution of the man, and he did evolve. He was constantly changing. Um, was um, you know you need to take a real bird's eye view and look at his entire life and the film seeks to do that it looks at the three ages of Brando you know right going back and, and with partly through regressive hypnotherapy which Marlon is doing himself yeah. to the boy you know and he was you know it was a very formative and important to him and he said that he spent his entire lifetime trying to solve the problems of his youth so telling that story was crucial um, the story of the adult and the actor you know in those roles and then um, and then the old man who was in, in retrospectively analyzing his life from Mulholland Drive um, but uh, but every single one of his roles he brought himself to he tells us that he says you, you know you bring yourself to every single character so they those characters they're all Marlon and life is imitating art yeah and he's he's either bringing himself to the character or bending the character to reflect himself so um so they're all relevant yeah I mean it's just inherently fascinating watching the documentary unfold and going through those chapters and finding out that kind of supporting information behind each of those times. Um, for me, like I had, a, you know, I, I had a curiosity around Marlon Brando for decades as well. 
and I remember looking through the catalogue after he passed, you know, they had an estate sale and I remember seeing that they had the DVDs that were on top of his, you know, DVD player were like the Three Stooges and like Groucho Marx and things like that and I thought that, that was also just a beautiful insight to this guy who everyone put so much on in terms of gravitas, you know, everyone just put this pressure on this guy as the greatest actor of the generation, if not ever. Um, but to show that he had this kind of sweet side, um, this comedic side, this playful side, um, was really kind of an important kind of moment in my understanding of him. True, too. He was very playful. And I, I don't know if the film, I, you know, there were some parts that were very comedic and, and he could, he made us laugh, but I, I think the other side of my dad, and, 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 and there should be part two, part three, because you can't get it all in, one, in 90 minutes. But um, yeah, there was playtime at dinner time with all of us kids, at, and, and he would do magic tricks, and you know, he, you'd be looking the other way, and he'd call your name. So if you look that way, Stephen, and then I call your name, Stephen, you'd, bu you'd bump right into him every uh -huh. time. And, or he'd, we'd be having dinner, and, um, and, it, and, and you're sitting right next to him, he'll say, oh my god, look at that elephant. There's an elephant out there. And you look, and then before you know it, your dish is gone. So those kind of things we didn't see, but... So he's saying he was hungry. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I think there's more about the plate. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting, but you know, that he, was, he was obsessed with this idea of myth, and then, of course, it was, you know, he looked at himself, like the myth of the mother, the myth of the father, mm -hmm. the myth of America. You know, then, then you've suddenly got, he's facing the myth of Marlon Brando, and he was always trying to wrestle to dismantle his own myth. Yeah. Because I'm not that person, I'm not this kind of, like, this, um, um, this figure now, this kind of heroic emblem yeah. that you're creating mm. and, it's, and it's interesting his whole life was like trying to you know, just put him break down the pedestal yeah it's always interesting when people who have accomplished so much get to share who their mentors and father figures and supporting characters were but for Marlon always seemed like he was always searching for that that rock that he could turn to it just seems like that person in his life mm -hmm. was never really quite there and so I'm curious do you know whether did he find that in Carl Malden or in Jack Nicholson did he find it who did he find it in? Like, so many people look up to him. Who did, who did Marlon, do you feel, kind of look up to and hold on to as, as someone who provided some of that stability for him? Do you know, it's interesting, actually, because Marlon, you know, he did, and it's not really shown in the film, but Marlon did have, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of a good collection of friends and close friends. Um, there was Wally Cox in the early phase, but Wally, Wally died young. Um, there was William Redfield. He was friends with Harry Dean Stanton, who I spoke to, Harry Belafonte, and... Uh, a, a, a wide array of, of you know range of characters, but but even them, you know, they might lose contact with him for a, lo a long time, or only have telephone relationships with him. So he, I don't think he had any kind of like sacred idol or savior. Mm. You know, I think he he would he would he, his life was very compartmentalized. I don't think he, you know, and, and he, a lot of it was that his own. I think he really discovered that strength comes from within. And I think his lifelong journey was actually to to, uh, um, to discover the boy. I, I, and this is my own feeling on it. That's sort of the rosebud of the film was him actually trying to discover. Um, the, the the problems of his own childhood and his nickname oddly enough was Buddy Brando and uh, you know and it's the it's the hunt for for Buddy Brando in a way yeah and it seemed like you know with having the kids around him with kind of this activism where he really was caring for others and being involved in the marches on Washington and all that sort of stuff and the freedom rides um, that you get the feeling that now with um, you know with what happened in Ferguson and all these sorts of things that he would have still been on the front lines of those conversations, that he'd always mm -hmm. be looking out for those sorts of people. And I don't know how much of that people were aware of before, so I, I think it's obviously super important that we get to see that side that you captured so well. That's, that's what he, he said, that was one of the main, in terms of his ask, what drives you? And he said that was it, how he could better his service to his fellow man. And he was a pioneer on that front, and he was really, I think he was very beyond all these like petty discussions <laughs> about race and prejudice and um, sexism, and because he was seeing it much further ahead in terms of what the real core problems of humanity, and what are the issues we've got to face as a collective, and, and his views on the environment. I mean, he was very forward-thinking, actually, and, and mm. in technological terms as well. Mm. You know, that, the, the 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 head in the film, the 3D head right. we have. I mean, yeah. that was all because he was. You know, he had this fascination with tech, and he had those scans done. You know, for well, well before, you know, CGI had really kind of like taken hold. Yeah, and just as sorry. Well, Rebecca. I was going to say on a on a personal level, I know in a, in a big big way he, he was a big activist for you know watch with Martin Luther King and but on a small level back at home when we'd be watching you know 
we watch sports together. So anytime we watch boxing, he would always say, who's the underdog? Who's not in favor? And he'd root for that person. Or for instance, today in the Super Bowl, he would go for Seattle mm -hmm. Seahawks over the Patriots. So always for the, the underdog. So the always trying to root for the ones who are struggling the hardest. I think one of your producers has a, will have an argument with you about who the underdog is going, in, going oh, is into the right? Super Bowl. Oh, okay. Reigning champs. Um, so, so there was this moment in the film where they discussed um, kind of the perfect minute that if you could be mm. yourself or if you could be in your career, if you could reach that pinnacle where you just felt like you had the perfect minute professionally. Um, I kind of love that concept for you personally. Rebecca, if you could have a perfect minute of doing something, what would that something be? For me, that perfect minute would to, for everyone to discover th their own self and be able to become their own analyst and to understand who they really are. Because I know my father, for the longest time, he was still trying to discover who he was. And, and you know, to age 60, 70, and I don't even know if he did ever, but I think that's what we all strive for. So uh, that would be my perfect minute to really know who I am. Mr. Director, perfect well, minute. I well, I think he was sort of, he's talking from a sort of creative point of view about, you know, the perfect expression, the perfect you know, the, uh, realization of your own goals and your own creative ambitions. And obviously, I mean, that, you know, we, that sort of leads into, you know, I think that one of his finest roles was The Godfather. But um, yeah, I'll still be chasing that like he was. I don't know. I'm not sure you ever. Maybe perhaps creatively, would you ever get there? You just—it's just, it's just the pursuit. It's on the horizon, isn't it? Very cool. Well, thanks for spending a few minutes with us. Appreciate Thank the you. chat and congratulations. Very cool. Thanks.